Just to Mankind. Be Mick Foley. I, you know, I had no idea that you did stand up. I mean, I, I knew I WWE fan. Uh, watched you for years and years doing that, and then it just blew my mind that that you've uh, entered the. Very difficult oh, and challenging uh, world of stand-up comedy. Difficult and challenging, put it mildly. You know what? Maybe you guys can help me on this. In the same way that WWE was able to take pro wrestling and, and ter make, turn it into sports entertainment, I need to find a term for what I do because it's more storytelling. <laughs> it's more spoken word, but with an emphasis on funny stories. Mm. But I was, uh, I was with a guy named Brendan Burns, who was an Edinburgh Award right. winner, and we did uh, Montreal together, and, and he was trying to figure out why... People would wait for wait in line to, for two hours for my autograph, but they weren't turning out to the shows. Now, fortunately, that's that's changing now. But he was like, finally, he's like, mate, I think I got it. He said, there's just been so many bad transitions to comedy that people expect you to show up with a bad bow tie and some one-liners. <laughs> and right. so when people come to the show, it's flattering. They walk away going, hey, that was so much better than I thought. But I'm like... Why is the bar, why is the bar set so low for me when I've <laughs> yeah. I've had books that made people laugh? You know when I, when people I got guys wrestling fans here like nodding their heads, and when they go really you comedy and I'll go well, you read my books right? They go yeah. I said, Did it make you laugh? Well yeah. Did you laugh out loud? Yeah. And I'll go be like what's the problem? So yeah. the problem I think is in how I presented it because it's not you know your standard <laughs> classic stand up. Yeah, I don't even know what that is. I mean I'm learning now. From being a part of this show, about what you guys go through, and Colin, have we experienced with that? I sure. I mean, well, uh, first of all, I think you worked with my cousin in Ireland. Did you work yes. at Tim Gage? Yes, I loved yes, him. Yes, he loved you, <laughs> and he said you were great. You know, and um, yeah, I mean, of course it is. I mean, it's a big thing with stand-ups right now, marketing, like my show right now. I'm calling it a stand-up play, Mick. There you go. All right, that's I good. Took the two terms. What you're talking about. You want to do like a rack and tour type stand up yes. thing, but you don't want to say rack on tour because people who say, What are you trying to be fancy, Mick? And then you got to say, No, I'm just using a French word, but you know. But I think I've got my break coming. You want to hear what the break is? All right. Uh, it's uh, June 1st. I'm at Caroline's, my first right. uh, wow. New York City headlining gig. That's big time. WWE's coming there to film it, not just to, to, to put it on their, their, you know, their internet, but with the idea of showing it to the powers that be who've heard I do these shows, but they have no idea what they are. And so it's uh, it's kind of, like I said, it's kind of frustrating. People walk away and go, wow, it's so much better than I thought it would be. And and I think once WWE takes a look at it, and don't get me wrong, if you ask me about my wrestling or my writing, I'll be like, ah, I was okay. I was I was all right. Yeah. But I really feel strongly about these shows because they're really, it's for me, it's like being in the ring without getting hurt, right, at right, least right. physically. <laughs> right. the, emotion, the, nice. the ability for emotional pain is always there. Of uh, course. <laughs> but uh, that's part of what makes, what makes it exciting. But I think once these uh, higher-ups get a look at it, that maybe they can then help 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 uh, market it to the wrestling fans as an extension of wrestling and not some wild uh, you know leap I'm taking. Right. Yeah. Well, also because look, Kathy Griffin tells stories, right? Yes. And she got on one net, whatever that network she's on, A and E. I don't know. Yeah, E or. So, yeah. but, but she was the only spe comedy special on there. So even if you're doing a comedy special on Comedy Central, there's 25 people. Yeah, yeah. But if you're the only game in town, like on WWE. Then it does focus it, you know. People need to be focused for stand up, you know. Well, we're hoping the audience we're hoping. too. Yeah, yeah, it's nice. Uh, they they got going to be have a nice crowd on hand there, and and things have really picked up, not just internationally but uh, nationally as well. And I I feel like I'm on that uh, precipice, Colin. That's that, great. Uh, things are looking up. How long have you been doing the stand up thing? I mean, man, when um, did you when did you stop wrestling? When did you start standing? Standing up, I keep trying <laughs> they to all say. Got, they all it kinda, makes sense that you would say standing up. They all kind of blur yeah. into each other uh, because I, I kind of I stopped wrestling full time in 2000. I, I wrote a book in 1999 that did, that did really well, and all of a sudden it made me a credible right. college speaker. Like I started getting uh, you know, you know uh, uh, questions about going to talk to. I spoke at MIT and Notre Dame at Syracuse. Wow. And with the exception of a few places that were like, talk about your road to becoming an author, they just say, you know, it's an evening with Mick Foley. So I'd go out and say, it's an evening with Mick Foley. How ironic, when I was younger, very few women wanted to spend an evening. <laughs> you know, like I had my little things in there. And I gravitated towards this, the, the stories that made people laugh. So I had uh, a, a show at the Imp. When that dried up after about seven years, somebody gave me a chance to do, to do a set of the improv. And the worst thing happened, which is, 
it went pretty well without much work being put into it. Like, I just had some ideas. That's the way I used to do with wrestling. And then once that happened, then I became, it got on the impression that I was good. Mm. I then started watching a lot of other comics, and then I subconsciously, I mean, as foolish as it sounds, I was going up there, not that I was doing Dave Chappelle's material, but I was using, like, his cadence. His persona, right. And then even with uh, Judah Friedlander, who's a buddy of mine, I'd find myself, after I'd tell a story, look at him and be like, yeah, man, yeah, that's right. And I, was, and I started losing what it was that people mm. liked about me. So I was actually becoming worse at it instead of better until, uh, until really last summer when Brennan Burns convinced me that uh, if people wanted to see the <laughs> comics talk about something other than wrestling, there were a lot of places to go. Right. And once I got to Montreal, I was under the same roof as like hundreds of more talented people than me. I was like, all right, I get it. I've got an audience, and I'm chasing them away by saying... I was essentially like Mick Jagger on a solo album going, I'm not playing Stone Tunes. Not that I know that he's right. done that, but right. that would be yeah. what it would be comparable to. Wow. I, I think... Well, I saw you actually wrote the book yourself, but you didn't have yeah, someone yeah. else uh, yeah. writing it for you. Um, I, I remember from WWE days that everyone said, you know, Mick Foley, the genius... <laughs> <laughs> is is very talented, but I I had no idea that that was legitimate, and uh, it absolutely seems to be. Yeah. Uh, so um, that now the the world of stand up seems so difficult. Uh, have you met with a lot of disappointment? Have you met oh, with a lot man, of man. Uh, g audiences that aren't digging on you? And and uh, tell us about that. Well, for the most part, I'm I'm doing shows that are geared towards my audience and in, in, in cases of someone you know has me open up and uh you know and I, I did my surprise sets and i would come in and i'd do 10 or 15 at governors and the brokerage and, I, and uh, guys would come out and they'd watch me the worst the I, I, the worst my worst experience ever doing stand-up is when i had essentially given it up but i was going to do a thing with the wounded warriors and i and i said to the guy hey i used to do some stand-up if you want i'll come up and do some and i showed up not knowing whether i was going to do a set or not mm. And if you've been at the places like Broadway where they have like eight, nine, ten good comics coming up in a row, you right. then sit there and go, wait, they're talking about things that I was going to talk about, That's right. which was, That's right. you know, yeah. was, you know. so you I found myself thinking up a new set. I hadn't done a set in six months, didn't have enough experience to do it, call it on the fly. And I went up there, and at one point I literally said, if I was in a pool... I would ask somebody for a life preserver <laughs> because I am drowning up here. And wow. I got off the stage. I was convinced that I would never do it again. And then Judah came up. First of all, I was following Judah Friedlander. He's like, dude, first of all, never come out of the crowd. You know, like, mm -hmm. <laughs> would you come out of the crowd for your matches? Like, no. He's like, dude, don't do it here. <laughs> and then he said, you know, and he, and, he, and he meant this as a compliment. He goes, you know, ordinarily, somebody goes four minutes without getting a single laugh. You know, they're done in comedy. But, dude, I'm telling you, people will listen to you. You weren't killing, but you weren't dying as badly as you thought. And, uh, you know, uh, speaking of Brendan, you know, I mentioned a few times people had never heard of him outside of England, but he was like... I heard of him. You, yeah, Brendan's like a comics comic, yeah. and he said the difference between a funny guy and a comic is that a funny guy will go on stage, bomb, and never step foot again, and a comic will show up 10 minutes later wearing a different hat, talking about how bad the guy is. <laughs> before it was. Nice. So, uh, it yeah. T yeah, man, it's, it, you know, it was, uh, I get, I'm at the point where I really love it, I really enjoy it now, but I, there were some really some sad nights, some, some lonely drives home okay. after gigs. Well, that, how does that compare to the life on the road as a wrestler? I similar. Think. It's very similar, and uh, I think the most similar uh, fact is that you ha end up having your best times and telling the best stories about the worst gigs. You know, for right. me, it was the night where I showed up. And this is as a guy, you know, well-known with, you know, face and name recognition. And I show up at a, a <laughs> I hate to say it, before, the promoter's in the green room. No kidding. <laughs> the promoter's <laughs> the in the room. Joel, yeah. Even Joel admit we showed up and uh, and the, the sign on the marquee it not only has the wing special, but it has last night's wing special. And we show up like, right. hey, well, we're here to do comedy. They're like, there's no comedy here. And we were like in the attic where there was a dozen people. And then I went out there and I just I had a great time. And that's when you realize, that's you know, how it goes. doesn't matter if there's, t you know, 2,000 or, or 20 out there. If you're feeling when, it and they're reacting, it's it's like being in the ring. Yeah. And it never fails when you have the perfect, like if you're doing a set and 
you're like, I don't want to go on right now because the perfect time is later and some guy will switch with you, you're going to bomb. You have to go on whenever you're supposed to go on. Like, if you try to set it up so it works, it's going to fail. You know what I mean? And then some other miserable thing. When you're not prepared, no expectations, it works, yeah. Can I tell you what I... this I, I announced on stage in London that this was, this was the greatest moment of my career. And I will try to keep it... You know, I won't swear. I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll keep it kind of PG-rated. But I tried this one time in Australia, and it just died. I looked out at 700 people, and none of them was the, was making an expression. But I was convinced that I could make it work. And it worked uh, It was off the idea that Brendan Burns, is a, who is a huge wrestling fan, he would go out and he would talk about this giant wrestler, and then he would imagine what that wrestler's mother's body part must be like <laughs> at this point. And he said that, uh, it, you know, I must whistle when I must sound like a Viking bullhorn, you know, or it makes the whole thing. <laughs> then I come out there, and I like those kind of dangerous moments, you know, where you don't, you know, you walk that line between fa fantasy and uh, uh, fiction. And so I walk out there and say, hey, listen, I don't want to, I don't care if you've won Edinburgh Awards or not. I don't care who the heck you are. I, you don't go insulting the people who put a roof over my head and food on my table. <laughs> He's looking at me like, are you serious? I was like, hey, and I've seen so-and-so's mother's vagina, <laughs> and it's amazing. <laughs> I said, hey, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't whistle either. It, it hums. <laughs> and, uh, and I just, I tried working uh, Warren Zevon's Desperados into the eaves, into the act, and that's uh, which is the only song I know that ends with a humming uh, oh, finale. Nice. Nothing. 700 people, nothing. Like, you, you'd think you'd never go there again because there's no potential. Yeah. Then I was in the show called Sunday Brunch, uh, <laughs> Uh, in, in England, I was got there a couple hours early and I was talking to this band called Hertz, kind of like a Depeche Mode type of band, very sad, very sullen. And I'm talking to their viola player and I find myself saying, hey, if there, maybe there's a part, you know, for a viola part in my show, would you be willing to do it? And tech, 10 seconds before we go live, I broke into the biggest smile and I, and I was like, I've got my viola part. And we gave it a try the last night. Of the, of the tour in London, and I walked out, and then we did, and we, Colin, we did really well. I'm not just saying we did really right, well, right, but right. nice, you know, really nice response. And I walked out, and I said, every sane bone in my body is telling me that this tour is over, <laughs> but I have to be able to look yeah. at myself in the mirror, and I'm not going home unless I give this a try. And we, uh, you know, I was by myself when I first started saying, you know, it went, mm, mm, right. it went, mm. and the moment I said, Miss Amy May on viola, the, the moment she came out and started playing the viola, we had them. And it was the most gratifying feeling, you know, it was so ridiculous and it was so juvenile. Right. <laughs> but I felt I felt like I was on top of the world. I felt like I did after like a huge, you know, huge pay-per-view match. Yeah. Wow. All right. Well, listen, we're going to we're going to come back with more Mick Foley after this.